Stories about the Kazakh Hans Bater's great battles victories. Ilyas adored them since he was a child. The boy imagined them. They were pretty much real for him. In his dreams, he saw Kenesari and Yerige, Bukhar Jirao and Koblande. For the first time, he heard about them from Akin Kagbai, who amazingly played the Dombra and knew many legends. Ilyas Yasin Berlin's father was a carpenter, and his mother was a housewife. She looked after the children, the elder one, Ilyas Eng Younger, Raunak. The boys grew obedient and hardworking. They helped their father and stuck together because the age difference between them was small, only two years. Raunak respected the elder Ilyas. Later, he called him the main person in his life. He used to call him Kishkintai Aga, little big brother, since Ilyas was shorter than him, even though older. Kishkintai, small, he was calling him. And it was Ilyas who helped him become such a man. They had very close relationship, and most importantly, they were spiritually very close. They wrote letters to each other all the time, almost all their lives. Twenties were the beginning of perhaps the most dramatic period in the history of Kazakhstan. The step faced modernization and collectivization. Philippe Goloshokin launched Small October in the steppe, which led to famine and diseases. This was the time when Ilyas turned eight and his brother Raunak six. That's when they have faced the toughest times. First, their father died from the black pox, then, their mother. The children were left alone. That was the very first and perhaps the most terrible challenge in the life of Ilyas Yes in Berlin. One by one, he lost his loved ones. His father, mother, then his relatives took away his brother. Ilyas had no choice but to go on the streets and get food for himself there. Uncle said that he can't take two of them. He could take care of only one. Well, of course, that was Rauna, who was younger, and my father had to wander around. The famine in the region was getting worse every day. Nobody cared about the miserable beggars. No one wanted to give them a piece of bread because they had their own hungry children. Without care of parents and love, children were quickly turning into wolf cubs. They needed to survive at any cost and they had to steal things and then hide. After all, the adults looked at them as they were an ineradicable evil. When it got cold, the boys from Ilyas's crowd started to die. Their bodies were found in various parts of the city. Yes, in Berlin was supposed to have the same fate. It was a really cold winter and he lived for several days under the bridge. If then the Soviet authorities did not find him, he would simply have died. The child remained alive only because he was rescued by social services, who have been searching for homeless children. That was a special campaign organized after the death of Vladimir Lenin. Hundreds of thousands of homeless children in those years wandered throughout the Soviet Union. They died from infectious diseases. They were freezing to death in basements and attics. The founded ones, including Ilyas, were sent to foster homes. And that's how Yesen Berlin stayed alive. My father told himself that he will withstand everything and will definitely get an education. He was keen to learn and therefore he did sports and studied a lot. He was morally strong. After the care home, Yesen Berlin got a job in the district executive committee in the city of Karsegbay. The famine in the 30s became another big shock in the life of Ilyas Yesen Berlin. In the summer, the city has announced the preparation courses for the Mining and Metallurgical Institute in Almata. 
and Ilyas has become a student of the mining faculty. It was impossible not to notice that student. He was so clever and educated. During the first extraordinary congress of Soviets of Kazakhstan in 1937, Yasin Berlin was elected as a delegate of this congress. According to some reports, he was an excellent student, an activist, an athlete, and in 1936 he took part in the Congress that adopted the first constitution of the Soviet Union. World War II, it changed everything. Ilyas was creative, educated. Such people were needed, a home front, and Ilyas could stay in Kazakhstan. But this was against his principles and his understanding of courage and patriotism. In September 1941, he went to the North Western Front to fight against the fascist invaders. Fierce battles near the town of Staria Rusa, the Nazi bullet hit Yasin Berlin in the right leg. Bleeding, Ilyas was taken to the hospital in Kostroma and then transferred to Sverdlovsk. The wound was so severe that it was decided to amputate the leg, but Ilyas begged not to cut it off. I have to live, treat it, I will stand anything, he said. As a result, Yasin Berlin went through two operations without anesthesia. The leg was saved but it was a few centimeters shorter. He walked with a limp all his life, which was sort of a memory of the terrible war. Ilyas was sent back home, as he was recognized as not suitable for further service. Dad never talked about the war. We knew that he was injured, that he had pains in his legs. During the day it was not visible. He never used a cane. In general it was not noticeable that his leg hurt and he used to lift his leg, trying to find a convenient position. Mom used to say, how are you sitting at the table? You see, we all sit properly. He used to say, Delia, you know that my leg hurts. Well, that's why it's so uncomfortable to sit especially in the evening. She used to say, well, I don't know. You should still behave proper ways. She was very strict for real, very strong. Delia, Dilara. Yes, in Berlin matter right after the war in Almaty, and that girl was destined to become the writer's first and only love. They met in the theater of opera and ballet, where Ilyas loved to go, not missing any premieres. And of course, he could not miss the performance of the legendary Galina Ulanova, who was evacuated to Almaty at that time. He fell in love with his wife at first sight, and until the end of his life, he loved her, and he devoted poems to her. My mother was so bold, acrid. He started paying attention. And she immediately told him, do not waste your time. I'm the daughter of the enemy of the people, and you work for the party. Forget me. But my father did not let her go. He said, so what? Since then, the couple never separated. Shortly before the day of victory, they had a small wedding. Ilyas worried a lot about the fact that her mother was still behind bars in the Akmola camp of the wives of traitors of the motherland. Ilyas used his connections in the All Russian Extraordinary Commission known as Cheka, his military merit, and released his mother in law. A year later, he had to pay the price. When dad married mom, immediately that fact was reported to the Central Committee. There was a denunciation that he married the daughter of the enemy of the people, and he was immediately fired. He was arrested at home in 1949. The authorities charged him with embezzlement of public funds. At that time, Yasin Berlin had a high position. He was the head of the Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan. He spent 10 years in camps at the construction of the Karakum Canal, 
Ten years of hard labor, in unbearable conditions. Few people could stay there for at least a year. But yes, in Berlin, stood five, knowing that he's remembered and waited at home. Ну, бабушка моя, вот, мать моей мамы, тети, они, ну, потому что уже и отец... И... My grandmother from the mother's side used to say, Dilara, he was sentenced for 10 years. He will not return. In times like this, no one comes back. You have three children. I'll take one. The aunt will take the second. You are such a beautiful young woman. You will get married for sure. But my mother said she would wait. Спокойно выйдешь сейчас замуж еще раз. Но ну, мать сказала нет, я говорит буду говорит, ждать. At that difficult time, only one person supported Delara, Yasin Berlina. That was Raunak, brother of Elias, with whom they were separated when they were children. After they grew up, brothers found each other. Raunak also studied literature. He became a professor and worked in Moscow. And Elias, Elias was surviving again, like when he was a child. Once again, he was facing hunger, cold, and heat. There people died very quickly, because it's very hot. In the winter it was really cold, and he was sent there because he was a mining engineer. God saved him for the third time. He said he prayed and did not even know what else to do. He was a mining engineer and was responsible for an important site, blasting workings. Yes, and Berlin was rehabilitated and released in 1953, immediately after Stalin's death. Inspired and ready to start a new life, Yasin Berlin lost his self in creativity. For many years in captivity, he built the plot lines in his head, thought about the images, and was ready to transfer his fantasies to paper, to breathe life into them. He was hired to the position of editorial editor in the publishing house of fiction. In the same place, he begins to write his first books, including his first life-affirming novel, The Song About a Man. Despite the dark past and a spoiled reputation, Yasin Berlin manages to recover in the party, thanks to the petition of Din Mohamed Kunayev. After that, his creative career gets a new twist. Starting from 1958, he worked at the Kazakh film studio side by side with Shakyan Aymanov as the editor of the scenario board. In 1962, he has become the editor of Kazgost Litizdat. Whenever I woke up, the lights were on in his office, even in the morning. Then he used to wake us up. When he started to write his novel, his trilogy, he took the hardest topic, Kinnisari Khan. Ilyas yes, in Berlin took it because the people loved it. You know, Kinnisari represents the spirit of freedom. Of course, this novel was changed a lot, and he still managed to describe the image of Kinnisari with the artistic words. Our independence is the shed blood of Khan Kinnisari and his soldiers. And he did it this way. He was the last Kazakh Khan who has united all the Kazakhs under one banner. His heart. At times, it seemed that it hurt all the time, since he was a little kid. He saw the death of loved ones, suffering people, injustice. Then he saw the war, hard times, and then again he faced prison, interrogation, and hard labor. He's went through all of this, but his heart still hurt. It hurt for the people who do not know the truth about themselves, about their history. It hurt that he didn't have the time to fulfill the plans. He worked hard, despite obstacles. Yes, and Berlin has finished the novel. At this time, the Russian writer Ivan Shukhov helped him a lot. He was the editor-in-chief of the Prostor magazine, and he was not only a great writer, he had a big heart. And he was the one who published the book in Russian without coordination, and it actually helped. The book was published by Sovetsky Pisatel, and then by Druzhba Naroda. 
И потом в дружбе народов в журнале, потом выходит окончательно, она выходит это, в, издательстве, в московском издательстве, в художественной литературе. Когда народ прочитал, это стало бестселлером. When people read it, it became a bestseller. Imagine, it was published at that time. Now the state publishes 2,000 copies. At those times, 100 million copies were made. And still, that was not enough. All people used to read the book knew the words. Wherever you go, this book was the most expensive one. He felt constant pressure. Of course, that affected him a lot. He was nominated for the Lenin Prize, and on the third round, he was just removed by his fellow Kazakh writers, close people. Yes, and Berlin did not receive the deserved Lenin Prize for his works. He got the Abai Prize only. But, as they say, talent will always find the way. Nomads became perhaps the best book in the history of Kazakh literature. A lot of people read it. The novel was published 12 times in Russian, in one and a half million copies in total. It was released in 30 languages, 50 times with a total circulation of about 3 million copies. However, envious people found explanation to that as well. Ten years of hard work of Yes in Berlin was described as self-interest. Like such a scale of the work was done only because of the desire to earn money. Only that. This, truly, large-scale writer could become the pride of any people, and his colleagues contributed to destruction of his health and, ultimately, reduction of his life. However, the last straw for Ilyas's opponents was his desire to rehabilitate. The Alash Orda in the 60s. Yes, and Berlin was the first person in Kazakhstan to raise this issue. He's named his grandson in honor of the poet Magjan Jumabayev. He also had an idea to write a trilogy about Alash Orda. The beginning of the 19th century was very important. It was the time for the formation of the Kazakh people. But he did not have the time. He collected the data. He began to make sketches. He did not have enough time. On May the 26th, the Central Committee of the Communist Party, together with the Writers' Union, Kazakhstan, had a large meeting on the development of Kazakh literature. It smoothly switched to the discussion of Ilyas's books. It turned out as if the Central Committee was discussing not the activities of the national literature, but considering works of Yesen Berlin. And in 1975, Yesen Berlin left the Writers' Union and devoted himself entirely to creativity. In 15 years of his creative activity, he wrote 16 books. He became truly a people's writer. That is the apartment where his whole life passed. He liked to work here at night when children were sleeping. Well, the first listener and reader of his works was, of course, his faithful wife, Dilara. There was a park near his house. Yes, and Berlin often walked there with his friends and fellows. The writer Yuri Dombrovsky, who was in exile in Almaty, Maurice Simashkal, who received the state prize for the translation of the nomads into Russian, and of course, Olja Sulimenov with whom they were close friends for many years. That was the house where Ilyas Yesin Berlin passed away. <laughs> 